President Biden signed today a bill that had passed uh, both the Senate and the House in recent days, uh, providing a lot more weapons and ammunition for Ukraine. They have been touting this for quite a long time. They've been fighting for it for literally six months uh, since the, the Biden first put up the request. Uh, it was now became law. And according to many reports, both from the White House and from the media, uh, a lot of those uh, weapons had actually already been pre-positioned. Uh, some of them are on the way now. Some were actually already in the region. And so it, it'll some of it will start showing up to the battlefield very soon. The big question is, is will this make a difference on the ground? Will this prompt Russia to take some actions that they haven't before. Because part of the issue uh, involved here is long-range ATACMs, what's called Army Tactical Munitions, basically Army Tactical Missiles, which have a range of up to 300 miles, which can go a lot further than anything has before. So the question is going to be, Russia has said in the past that that's going to be a problem, that they might retaliate and respond if those missiles are used on Russian territory. Was that just a, a boast? Was that just a, an empty threat? Or do they actually mean it? And if so, what might they do? Those are things we're going to look at today. Uh, and as always, we have somebody great to help us unpack some of that stuff. And it's one of our new favorites, Colonel Jacques Beau. <laughs> and uh, man, we are so grateful to have you on. Former uh, Swiss strategic intelligence officer, former NATO officer, uh, and uh, author of so many books uh, that uh, really, I mean, you write the book on nearly everything. So great to have you back, Colonel. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me back here in your show. Thank you. Uh, so let's get into the, to the first point here, even before I start showing you some of the, the clips here, uh, just from, even without knowing what's in this bill, what is your gut reaction to tell you, is this going to make a difference on the battlefield? No, definitely not. This is just a face saving exercise for the Biden administration. The thing is that if you noticed, uh, the, the West is slowly crossing all the red lines is it, it, it established for itself in the in the past two years. Uh, first, we didn't want to to send uh, uh, military equipment, and finally we did. We didn't want to send Abrams and one Abrams. We did. We didn't want to send missiles, and now we are doing it. So I mean. This is a uh, and uh, the same for the Germans. At the beginning, they just yeah. wanted to send some some helmets and things like this, and finally they are discussing sending Taurus missiles. So we we are crossing all these lines, and th this just shows that everything we have done has just failed. And the right. the, the the reason of 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 insisting of sending uh, equipment is just as I said. Uh, a face-saving exercise just to try to uh, um, avoid the criticism of having done nothing for a situation that was desperate for the very first day, in fact. Well, you know, that that's what it appears to me, that, that a face-saving, but a face-saving still has to have some pathway to get off the stage so that the, the, the truth doesn't become exposed. We don't seem to be doing that. As a matter of fact, here's a couple of statements from President Biden just hours ago uh, when he was trying to explain really what's at stake here. Check this out. It's amazing what they do. I mean, it's amazing against such a larger military. Ukraine has regained over half the territory that Russia took from them in this invasion. And they won important victories against Russia's Navy. But make no mistake about, they're a fighting force with the will and the skill to win. The will and the skill to win. See, that doesn't sound like I'm trying to get off the stage and just get rid of it for now. He's First of all, he's making this, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing this, this claim that's almost a talking point that Ukraine has recovered 50% of the territory from the, from the, they took from the beginning. Uh, that, that's, that's deceptive at best. And it's, and it's just a lie at worst. It's because, absolutely. Yeah. Because what happened earlier on doesn't matter. It's what's happened, especially in the last year plus now we're in a year and a half is, and what's happening now is really what matters. And I assure you, they're not gaining territory on the Ukraine side, but the last part he said there is what I want to ask you about. First of all, he says that, you know, the Ukraine won some big naval battles. And to, to be honest, they did. They have sunk a lot of the ships of the Black Sea Fleet. That doesn't have anything to do with the ground fighting, as you've said before. But when he says they have the skill and the will to win, how does what do you think of that? 
No, they they don't have the skills. They don't have. They probably have the will because everybody wants to win. But the problem is that they have. They don't have the right army for that. Uh, first of all, remember that the uh, the Ukrainian army, as it was uh, at the very beginning of the Russian offensive, was basically made ineffective just by May June 2022. So in something like three, four months, the Ukrainian army was just ineffective and ineffective. And that's the reason why Zelensky started to ask for foreign assistance and support in, for, in providing equipment. And then, then the Europeans sent old uh, ex-Soviet equipment that was still in the storage of, uh, of East European countries. And that this equipment was sent to uh, Ukraine and lasted up to the end of 2022. And as this was exhausted, the, um, the, uh, the Zelensky asked to have more modern equipment or Western equipment. And from that point, that mean that was uh, mid-December 2022, we start to talk about Leopard tank, Challenger tank, uh, M1 Abrams tank, and so on, Bradleys, and so on. And that was delivered at the beginning of 2023 in order to perform the uh, so-called counteroffensive of uh, June uh, 2023. And this was, in fact, destroyed during that uh, counteroffensive. And now we, are, we have uh, Zelensky repeating the same exercise asking for new weapons, asking for new support, asking for everything. Because the problem is, as I already said, is that the Ukrainian army was not in a, in a position or capable of using the equipment it received in a consistent manner. The, the Russians have a consistent doctrine, a military doctrine, equipment that is say, tailored for that doctrine, a, people, officers, and a command and control structure that is tailored to, for that doctrine. The problem is that Ukraine has a patchwork army with no real command and control structure adapted to that kind of army. The, the 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 Ukrainian army has probably physically disappeared because, as we have learned, uh, by well, this is uh, Russian figures, but if in, in reality, if we look at Ukrainian some Ukrainian uh, information, it seems that it be confirmed that the Ukrainians have lost like half a million people. That means that all these guys that were fighting since uh, February 2022, they probably have disappeared. So we have now an army that has been poorly trained, uh, very rapidly uh, sent to the battlefront without real experience. Even the soldiers complained that the NATO uh, trainers that they had in UK and Germany didn't know about the kind of warfare that was waged in Ukraine because right. these guys had Ukraine or Afghanistan experience, which is a totally different kind of experience. As a result, we have an army which is not in a position. They probably have the will. I can. I. I I'm. I'm partly. I, I partly agree with that. I say partly because more and more we see. Uh, Ukrainian units that refuse to obey orders, including yeah. the famous, the Azov. famous Azov Battalion, yeah. uh, which in fact is the equivalent of what you had in the German army, if you compare the, the Wehrmacht uh, and the Waffen SS, which was yeah. the elite force, where, which was very strongly indoctrinated and all that. So the Azov Battalion uh, today is the Third Storm but, uh, Brigade. These guys are extremely politically, ideologically oriented. And when these guys start to refuse obey order, I think we are facing an internal crisis right. within the force. So I think maybe the will is there. We can question that. But they certainly have not, have not the capacity and the capability. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think from the beginning that the will has unquestionably been there. Why wouldn't it be? I mean, if your country was invaded by another country and your cities were getting blown up, of course you have the will to do it. But the question has always been, do they have the capacity? And, and, and I love the description you just gave there because it is so much more than just having a few high-profile weapon systems like the ones that you mentioned there. And it's having a system 
and, and that includes everything from logistics, from training, exactly. from institutional, uh, the, the doctrine that you're talking about, and all of that inculcated together is vital. It's, it's essential to win, Absolutely. and they've got almost none of that. Absolutely. I think we underestimate that sometimes in the West, that an army is a system and you cannot just just assemble things from here and there to, to make something. An army is a system and has to work as a system. The command and control, doctrine, logistic, everything must be fit, must fit together. And that's exactly what is missing for Ukraine. So I, I'm, I'm not sure this will go. Uh, this will uh, be an advantage for Ukraine now. This the, the 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 support we provide. In addition to that, when we talk about the success on the on the Black Sea, well, the, the Black Sea is a sideshow because uh, the the everything what happens is on the ground, not on the sea. So they may have. Uh, 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 hit some some ships and things like that, mostly without significant damage, by the way. So ships have been hit, but with no real, uh, let's say, major impact on the capabilities of the Russians in the Black Sea. But even if it were so, the, the war happens on the ground. And what, uh, as you rightly pointed out, the... Um, what, what uh, uh, Biden says is just a, a, a lie. And that was demonstrated, I think, if I remember, it was an article of the New York Times that explained that, in fact, the, the, the Russians got more territory than the one that was recovered by the, by the yes, Ukrainians. So, that is correct. And, yeah. and that was end of last year, if I remember. So yeah. this is... So, uh, so we're going to break down in just a second the what's in this package, and then we're going to look at what some other people are saying about it here, and I, and I want your commentary on that. But one of the other fundamental things that, that Biden said today, which is repeated by a lot of different people, uh, but I want your commentary on it here. Uh, I think I know what you're going to say, but I'll, I'll, I don't want to say it for you. First of all, here's what Biden said about the consequences of what this war could mean. As I've argued for months... This is directly, directly in the United States' national security interest. If Putin triumphs in Ukraine, the next move of Russian forces could very well be a direct attack on a NATO ally. And you all know full well that invoking Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty would be the first thing that comes to mind, which declares an attack on one as an attack on all. If Putin attacks a NATO ally like he's attacking Ukraine today, we'd have no choice but to come to their aid. Now, you're not an American officer, so I, maybe you can't authoritatively say whether it is or isn't in America's vital national interest that Ukraine win. But I think you can say with a lot of confidence, address his comment there that if Ukraine, if Russia, first of all, defeats all of Ukraine, that it could then march on NATO. What do you say yeah. in terms of that capability? Well, first of all, of course, I cannot speak as an American because I'm not, as you rightly said. But if it's in, in U.S. interest, then it would be in, in European interest as well. Because at the end of the day, if I take uh, uh, for granted what, what Biden said, then the European, uh, the whole European security is at stake here. But I think it's, it's totally wrong. The Russians have demonstrated extremely uh, careful planning, careful uh, understanding of the strategic situation. And if we look at the way they wage this war, they are always uh, in, in a position, I mean, they, they never went full steam into an offensive, an all-out offensive, and, and, and um, to deploy uh, equipment, uh, troops, and, and weapons that are totally destructive. They are very progressive in the way that they wage their war in order to have always uh, uh, be able to step up their, their offensive. And that's uh, that's something we, we tend to ignore in, in Europe, also because the media uh, propagandizes uh, something totally different. We always have the impression that the you, that the Russians go always full power in, in the in the country. It's not exactly true. They keep their forces in order to have 
the capacity to increase the pressure and they have to the ability to increase progressively the pressure. That's exactly what we see, for instance, if we talk about the um, destruction of the power on the power grid, for instance. Last year, you had already missile, missile strikes on the, the Ukrainian power grid, but they attacked just the distribution centers, something that could be easily repaired. And today they, uh, they increase the pressure and they attack the, uh, the electricity production uh, yeah. power plant. So that means they are able and, and to... Let me ask you uh, that question because I, I did notice that. I did notice that last year it was on the, the distribution centers and I noticed that it was repaired a lot. And I, I was wondering why would they spend so many missiles doing something that could be quickly repaired and then why the change this year to the actual production facilities, which can't be replaced quickly. What's the difference? Well, uh, most probably, and there is a very ex excellent article from John Helmer uh, on the uh, Dance with Bears um, on his blog, and he explained that quite in, in details. And I think it's a very good explanation of that. It means it, it is the idea that uh, then it was the purpose was to deplete the uh, Ukrainian anti-aircraft, anti-missile uh, cap capabilities. And they attacked items that Ukraine was obliged to protect through uh, uh, anti-aircraft missiles, but without, um, they didn't want to attack civilian or, yes, civilian centers or population. And today it's different because now we see that the Ukrainians are missing all these missiles. They have no anti-aircraft uh, missile anymore. Uh, uh, so meaning that now they have a free uh, uh, space, if you want, to attack wherever they want. And now they can, they can really attack deeper into Ukrainian territory. They can attack more strategic significant uh, the system, but the the reason why they did that last year is that they they wanted to deplete the anti-aircraft missile because they expected this counteroffensive, and they had no they they, they feared they had not the uh, air supremacy to protect their own forces, and they were not able to bomb. Uh, the, um, the the attacking Ukrainian forces. So that's why they rushed against the power grid to make the Ukrainian use this missile. And if you remember in the leaked Pentagon documents that were produced and you had a, a map of the uh, Ukrainian capabilities in terms of anti-aircraft missiles. And there is a very interesting map where mm. they showed that the by May last year, almost all anti-aircraft capabilities were depleted by in, in Ukraine. And that means that just before the start of the so-called counteroffensive, Ukraine yeah. had no longer any anti-aircraft capability. So that was an extremely wise uh, um, uh, uh, operational op operation uh, in order to, to have then free hand to protect their own force with the, the aviation and uh, attack helicopters. And that's exactly what we have seen during the counteroffensive. So, so what you're describing there is is, is really a, a a patient and methodical process to to just to go after these areas here. And, and now it's looking like the city of Kharkiv might possibly be a next target. But all of that to me says uh, makes it nearly impossible that that Biden is telling the truth or that he's even accurate, and that as soon as they're, quote, finished with Ukraine, that they're going to roll into a 32-member alliance with any possibility of success. I, I mean, to me, it seems like it would be just suicidal for any leader to do that, and Putin is anything but suicidal. How do you relate to that part? No, absolutely. I fully agree with you. The The Russians have an extremely, I mean, the, the, the Russian general staff is known to be very good in planning. And in fact, if, he, if we observe uh, from a very impartial point of view, the operation that was planned uh, in the very beginning of this operation, I mean, on February 2022, we see that it was very carefully planned. It was not using too much force, but just the necessary force for in, in uh, for, to achieve a certain objective, but very clear objectives. 
And that's exactly what we are doing. The, remember, this operation was meant to demilitarize Ukraine, not to invade Ukraine, not to destroy NATO, not to, to attack the rest of the world and things like this. This was to demilitarize the threat against the population of Donbass. Since then, this objective has been reached and they raised, in the Clausewitzian perspective, they have raised this objective and now they are, they are managing to demilitarize Ukraine. And they will continue that as long as we help Ukraine, they will continue demilitarizing Ukraine. And demilitarizing not just in terms of military capabilities, but also in terms of economic capacities. I mean, I have mentioned already, I think, uh, in this um, uh, program, that the Germans plan to have, uh, to create a, a production plan for Leopard's Uh, uh, I mean, the new version of the Leopard tank and Rheinmetall was in principle basically uh, um, committed to build a, a production plan in Ukraine. And the Russians are making everything impossible to do. In fact, right. they're just destroying yeah. the whole uh, industrial network that Ukraine has. And the, 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 the uh, Russians have understood that If they don't do that, we will continue to make this, to extend this war, to continue to provide weapons, to make a, a, an unending war. So the idea of the Russians is to make this exercise stop and to make impossible for Ukraine to continue. They will destroy but then, but everything. Then, let's, say that, let's say that they eventually, whether it's there's negotiated settlement or, or if there's not, and Russia goes all the way, say, to the Dnieper and, and compels Uh, a an end of war negotiation on on basically terms of surrender. Will they then go into Western Europe? No, they will certainly not. This is not their objective. They never said they would do that. We don't even see. You know, again, it's important to understand. We in in the media, in the Western media, we we try to portray the Russians are waging war without objectives. This is wrong. The Russians work with objectives. They have objectives, they stick to that objective, and they work with that. So if we, we try, it's the same as we if we read our so-called experts, they tell you that they wanted to invade Ukraine, to expand Russia, to make a new Tsarist empire, the new Soviet Union. The Russians have never said that. So we yeah. invent objective, objectives, right. we make them out. And the Russians have never said that. They, are ve they, they have defined very uh, consistent, very, uh, um, uh, how to say that, uh, um, reachable objectives. And they proceed very consistently towards these objectives. So it's, 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 it's totally absurd to create objectives. The, the fact is that we create objectives yeah. for the Russians and then to say, well, they didn't reach these objectives. Right, so. right. <laughs> and then we ignore what they actually did say. That we, there's a lot of that going on here. Uh, let me shift back into where we started with this, with this, this aid package here. Let's look at a few things. So uh, not all the West are, are actually getting on board with cheerleading. So there's a little bit of optimism here that some of the truth is getting out. Here's Sky News saying that this is more like a lifeline than, than that it can change the war. There's no doubt that they'll be useful, but like every weapon in war, whether they're long or short range, fancy or not fancy, that there is no silver bullet to victory in this war. There is no wonder weapon, no single wonder weapon, that is going to deliver a decisive long-term advantage to Ukraine if it's not meshed in with a range of other Uh, technologies, tactics, people, these kind of things. So it will be useful. It will allow them to reach further into Crimea with different weapon systems. I mean, when you do long range strike, you don't just use one weapon system, you use a variety to put the enemy in a dilemma and confuse them. It will be useful, but it is not in and of itself a war winning weapon. Uh, obviously, that wasn't Sky News. We'll get to that in just a second, but that still is, is a good one to talk to there because uh, I, I think that this, if I've seen, if I remember correctly, I've seen him actually been pretty pro Ukraine and and and, and pro going down that path here. But even he says 
It's not a wonder weapon. It's not going to change anything with ATACMS yeah. because that's one of the things that in this. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what ATACMS is and why it's not decisive. Well, ATACMS, as you know, is a, is a long-range uh, missile that can be uh, uh, shot uh, or fired from the uh, high Mars system or the same the same launcher, basically. And the the thing is that uh, Zelensky is asking for these uh, long-range missiles since uh, 2022. The uh, U.S. has provided some, but with reduced range because they didn't want... Uh, the Ukrainians to reach the Russian territory. Uh, now it appears that they have agreed to provide a long-range version of the attackms that range up to 300 kilometers or so. Now, the, 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 the thing is, my feeling is that the reason why Zelensky wants those long-range mis missiles is to destroy the Kerch Bridge. I think that for the Ukrainians, destroying the Kerch Bridge is probably symbolic of a kind of victory. This is, they know they will not be able to repel the, uh, the Russians. They will not be able to make an offensive that reached Moscow or something like that. They will not push the Russian back, but they probably can destroy the Kerch Bridge. And that's the reason why you see so many attempts to destroy that bridge, because I think it's it's more symbolic. It has kind of a, a moral value for the for the Ukrainians, and I think that's if if they the uh, they receive this attack, they will be used for that. Now, it's it's probably not so effective because the the thing is that the Russians have also understood that, and they probably have the uh, the equipment. They have a variety of counter different uh, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. missile defense. And I'm not sure this will make a difference. And I, as as uh, as you said, the this kind of Wunderwaffe, so the wonder weapon, yeah. uh, it, it reminds me exactly what we had in 1945 when the Germans, or specifically Hitler, because the the his generals were a little bit wiser. But uh, um, Hitler had in mind that he could probably achieve victory just through a couple of new weapon systems. And as, as we know, as military, and as we said uh, earlier in this uh, today, the, an army is a system. You can't just have a victory just because you have one system. Probably, well, probably we have an exception with the nuclear weapon in, on Hiroshima in Japan in, in, uh, in 1945, but that's probably an exception. Um, but for the rest, I, I don't think you can achieve victory just by having one system, unless yeah. it's a very powerful and this dis right, right, yeah, something that's like yeah, the destructive power is is enough to overcome. But any typical system, and certainly long range missiles, are one of those. Uh, when you're looking at the whole package of things, aside from just the ATACMs, you had this guy from uh, Sky News uh, actually, and he's also been very pro Ukraine. Beside, but even he's saying this is not going to change the game. I'm not sure it's going to be a turning point. This feels more like a lifeline at the moment uh, for, for Ukraine. To prevail, it's going to need a steady supply of weapons. It's not going to get those. Russia is already spinning up its defence industrial base. Russia knows that it will fail if the West was to get further involved in this, and that's why we're seeing Lavrov and President Putin issue these great warnings, this threatening rhetoric. But so far, that has been very has not had the effect uh, of actually affecting the Western political resolve, which doesn't seem to yet be determined to provide a full support to Ukraine. Now, he's right there, and, and I think that just matches what you've been saying, that this it's like a lifeline. It's it's definitely not going to change this point here. But he makes the comment at the end of that statement that I've heard from many others in the West. It says, but the West hasn't decided to give full support to Ukraine by this time. Do you see any kind of package or any kind of any amount of weapon systems or money or anything else that would decisively change the dynamics on the ground in Ukraine? No, and, and just for a simple reason is that as we see today, and we see that also um, if we if we look at the conflict in in Israel, that the West has not enough capacities to produce the equipment that would be necessary for for one conflict. I mean Ukraine, but even even more for two conflicts, and we see that. Um, 
the U.S. specifically has to take from its own storage uh, equipment to 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 supply Israel or Ukraine, and that's the same for 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 France or Germany. They are taking from their own uh, equipment to to send to Ukraine, meaning that you know, and that contradicts also the idea that um, Russia would attack Ukraine after uh, uh, would attack Europe after Ukraine, because we are providing all our weapons. To, uh, to 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 Ukraine and it's our own own storage, meaning that we are depleting our own capacities to provide to Ukraine. Meaning that this idea that if we don't do that, uh, uh, Russia could attack uh, uh, Europe has uh, uh, makes no sense. But this is the problem of industrial capacity. Remember that it's probably not exactly the same in the U.S., but in Europe. Most of the um, military industrial complex used to be uh, state owned in most countries uh, during the Cold War. And that's why we were able to have uh, any weapons. It's a, the, the, exactly the same system as the, the Russians have now. It's, mm. uh, it's a state owned uh, 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 industrial base. And since the end of the Cold War, in most countries, that applies very much to, to France or Switzerland or so. We privatize our, our equipment, meaning that the weapons production is not no longer a question of the national interest, but a question of profit. Yeah. So you and and if if you you have you don't have the prospect of having a, a market, so you don't expand production, and that's exactly what we have now. Most even in the industry in France, for instance, they have a hard time to find production, and that's exactly, by the way, the problem that the Czech uh, president had because he promised to have one million, uh, right. one fifty-five millimeter shells, and he didn't manage to find that. Why? Because everybody understands that the defeat of Ukraine is a matter of months, and. At best, it would last until the U.S. presidential election. So <laughs> meaning that why would you invest millions to expand your production facilities right. if everything collapses in, in a few months? So, you right. know, we, because we, just imagine what, what, what would be the, the financial motivation for a private company to invest in these things that are going to take long term. Like in the U.S., it's going to take about another 18 months to get up to this full capacity from now, based on this money that was put into this current bill here before the stuff's coming off. Well, if the war is ended in the next three or even 12 months, what are they going to do then? Now they have this big capacity and there's no orders for it. Exactly. That's that's exactly the point. So, you, you know, uh, the, the, the problem of su supporting Ukraine is not simply a political or a question of will, of willingness. It's just a matter of capacity. We don't have it anymore. And, right. and, and this is it. And uh, Ukraine has to understand they, they mismanaged their, the equipment they had in the first phase of the war, if I can put it that way. I mean, in the first six months. And since then, they are waging a war with kind of patchwork army. But now it's 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 gone. So, but the problem of Zelensky, he knows that he cannot accept that. He cannot acknowledge that because otherwise he would probably be killed in the in in the within days. So I think he's more or less. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a kind of a, of a, a, a death penalty on him somehow. somehow. And but, but here's 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 the problem because I, I agree with you that the uh, the U.S. presidential election is a big driver for what Biden's doing and why he's saying what he's doing and how he wants to at least push this past November the fifth. And I understand why Zelensky. Maybe his life is physically in danger from domestic sources if he if he goes down the negotiated path. I don't know. But here's the problem with the path going down. Uh, the first one, obviously, that tens of thousands, if not more, Ukrainian men are going to continue to die over the next five or six months or seven months heading into that election. But here's the other issue. Russian side of this. They have shown great patience, but we have to be careful that it's not an endless patient. Here's what uh, Sergei Lavrov said following the passage of that bill. Сегодня США и их натовские сателлиты по-прежнему одержимы идеей нанести России стратегическое поражение. 
готовы и далее сдерживать нашу страну, что называется, до последнего украинца. При этом западники опасно балансируют на грани прямого военного столкновения ядерных держав, что чревато катастрофическими последствиями. That, that either through miscalculation, whether Zelensky uses these long-range missiles to hit something inside of Russia, uh, or that some other mistake can be made, or, or whether, say, for example, Macron uh, gets foolish and actually sends troops into to fight on, on behalf of Ukraine or Poland. What is the risk, in your view, of what Lavrov's talking about? Is it real, or is he also just posturing? Well, I think, well, uh, probably a little bit of both, in the sense that Personally, I'm confident that uh, the uh, Russian leadership, including the political as well as the military leadership, are very rational. But I'm not so confident that the European uh, uh, rational uh, uh, leadership is so rational. We see that Emmanuel Macron and even the Germans, you 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 don't feel that they they think rationally. Now they are trying again for them also to 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 save their face, <clears throat> and. They could be led to do anything. Look at Macron. Macron has its uh, troops or its army expelled from Mali, from Niger, from Burkina Faso. Now it seems that Chad would <laughs> would go the same way. So, and, and he's ridiculized within its, his his own country. He could be led to do some kind of desperate things. You know, the, the problem is that when people feel that they are defeated, that they are losing the the their the war or the conflict or whatever, they may be led to desperate things. And I I, I think the concern of the Russians is probably that the European leadership could be led to some extreme situation. I, and, and on that, I think the Russians might be very uh, uh, worried. So that's that's the problem. But from the Russian side, I don't think so. The Russian, by the way, they have a very clear doctrine as to the use of uh, nuclear weapons. The, the, the nuclear weapons of the Russians are designed to protect the existential threats towards uh, Russia. That means if, for instance, the leadership of uh, Moscow or the, the central uh, uh, leadership or the centers of leadership would be threatened, they would start considering using uh, nuclear weapons. But they will not use nuclear weapons just to strike a unit, even a French or NATO units in, in, uh, in Ukraine. They have enough instrument for that. They have so many hypersonic weapons that the NATO is not even able to intercept. So I think the, the Russians will not will certainly be the last ones to use the nuclear weapons if they are not directly threatened. Yeah. So I'm it, I'm not it, so worried about about uh, that. So there is a little bit of it, it's disappointing. It's, it's it's embarrassing that you're actually more worried about the Western leaders acting irrational yeah. than the Russian leaders acting irrational. That's that by itself is a is a point of shame for us Westerners. I think. Well, yes, but as as I said at the very beginning, you know, the problem is that the West crossed every single red lines they defined for themselves. You know, we we yeah. have defined. I mean, we the the the, the Western leaders have defined red lines they would not do uh, to, to, for Ukraine, but they have crossed all of them. All. So meaning yeah. that. You know, that, that means that the, the decision making is not rational, because if you define a red line, that means you, you define a red line, you, you define your red line. I mean, I will not do that. But considering yeah, because, everything, and then they, then they did will, it, they saw there was no action. They go, well, maybe we'll do this one and this one. And, and now exactly, that the risk yes. is certainly at some point you think there are no red lines and we can do anything. And that's well, that's where it starts that's getting exactly, dangerous. That's exactly the point. You see, a rational decision making would assess the situation rationally from the very beginning, say, okay, that's the situation. If it evolves in that direction, then the red line is this one. Or if in another situation, then we have this red line. But that these are the things we are not going to do. But the fact of the matter is that we see that the uh, Western leadership 
had absolutely no idea of the conflict they were engaging into. You see, the the I, I remember the French Minister of Economy saying on the 1st of March, that means just one week after the beginning of the uh, uh, military operation, the Russian operation, he said, we will make Russia to collapse. And obviously that has not happened. And even as a minister of economy, you should have known that uh, Russia has has a more, much more resilient economy as 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 the the the, the media said. Right. But obviously he didn't know that. So meaning right. that we have a leadership that doesn't work. Again, you know, I'm I'm a, I come from the background of strategic intelligence. Meaning, strategic intelligence is exactly the intelligence that advise the government. So, meaning that if when I see today what, how people decide, I say, but where are the strategic intelligence? Well, <laughs> officers? and and, who, and here's here's one more. Who's I, advising I, I, them? <laughs> well. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't show you this. We've shown this a couple of times on some of our, our recent shows, something that Zelensky said uh, uh, just a few days ago that I want to play for you because I want to ask you from a little different perspective than we played it before. How much do you think he really means this? And how much is this is just acting? Because he does have some experience at that. And what's the ramifications of it in any way? So in my view, he's basically setting himself up as the savior for all of Western Europe. Check this out. Mm -hmm. How long should Americans be expected to fund the war in Ukraine? The Americans are not funding the war in Ukraine. They first and foremost protect freedom and democracy all over Europe. And Ukraine is fighting, and Ukraine is sending its best sons and daughters to the front line, and it reduces the price for all Europe, for all NATO. It reduces the price for everyone, including the U.S. So he's he's here for all of it. It's like a messiah complex. How much of that does he mean, and what is the comp what is the consequence, regardless of what he means? Well, I think he's compelled to do that because the problem of Zelensky is that he understands that Ukraine is failing and he understands also that the Western leadership is less and less keen to support Ukraine. Not I mean, probably politically, but also because we can't do it. So he tries to, to, to make the stake higher in order to to oblige the West to, to respond. He knows that only the U.S. has resources. By the way, it's interesting that you have European Union. There are 32 countries that basically should have the, the money to help you. But he doesn't ask to the European Union. He, he asked the U.S. because he right. Knows right. that with Biden, it's a little bit easier because you have one guy that decides yeah. and he can just... You know, with just a, a snap of the finger, it can, I mean, more or less because we saw the difficulty in the Congress. But in any case, it's a little bit easier with the, the, the U.S. than in Europe, because in Europe, you also have some countries. I mean, Slovakia, for instance, uh, um, Hungary. The, uh, Hungary, they are, they are questioning the purpose and the reason why we should continue supporting that instead of finding a negotiated solution, because everything we are putting in terms of money, equipment, and all that in the conflict leads nowhere. And Zelensky understands that. So he has to, to, to make the stake higher. And that's the reason why yeah. he presents himself as the savior of the world. He, he can try, but here's the problem. And, and, and in the last few minutes we have here today, I, I wonder if you to uh, just give your best projection of, of what this would mean here. So as you pointed out, it took a long time to get this uh, package of $60 billion, most of it, which is going back into the United States, passed. But as, as I was on a panel er, earlier today on a different uh, show, uh, some of the people are saying, Almost certainly, that's it. There won't be another uh, funding bill like this. And what's going to happen if this was the final bill? What is Zelensky going to do if the United States Congress doesn't come up with another $100 billion like in six months or so? Because this is a very short-term deal, very very going to uh, be burned up pretty quickly, and they'll be demanding more. But I'm not sure more is coming. If no more comes, 
what happens to this war? Well, <laughs> there are two, way, two, two ways of answering the question. I can bypass your question by saying, well, if the Americans can, cannot uh, uh, provide more help, they will ask the Europeans to do it. That's probably one possibility. The other, the other thing, if no support uh, comes to, to, to Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine will be destroyed. And as long as, uh, uh, as Zelensky doesn't want to have a negotiated sol solution, and probably for, for domestic reasons, he cannot probably do that. By the way, as I already said, he issued a decree that prevents any negotiation with, you, with Russia as long as Vladimir Putin is in power. So, I mean, we are already at this stage, meaning that if if it if they there is no further help but even if there is any help by the way i think because the help he will receive and everything what's left in the west if if we provide it to ukraine it will not change anything because the the the, the skills of the soldiers the willingness of the soldiers to fight is fading away and therefore i'm 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 confident it will not change anything and the result is that ukraine will be totally destroyed. And the, interestingly enough, I talked recently to a Ukrainian here in Brussels, and he told me exactly the same thing. He's a refugee here in Brussels, but he understands perfectly that the only issue for this uh, his country is just to be destroyed if there is no any negotiation or negotiated solution to the conflict. The problem is that the West has no exit ramp for this conflict. And therefore, we have no other option than just provide uh, providing weapons. This is just insane. In fact, this is yeah. this just shows the incapacity of the Western leadership to understand how a situation may evolve, and that we are in exactly in that dynamics. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that really so discourages me. And because uh, I mean, you you've laid it out very clearly again, whether this is the final tranche whether this tranche came, whether this tranche didn't come, it's not going to change the outcome. The outcome is sealed because of the, the, the larger dynamics that go into national combat power and all the things you laid out in, in really great detail about the systems of combat that don't exist on the Ukraine side, no matter how much money we put in there. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and providing such clarity on this and, and, and just driving through the BS that's both in some of the European capitals and, and our own capital here in Washington and getting to the hardcore ground truth reality of it. And we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And and listen, folks, you, you got a job to do too. We, we, we're we thankful for Colonel Bo for coming out with this information here uh, and, and just shredding the thing down to the, to the brass tacks like you've seen here. Don't keep this to yourself. Share this with other people. Share this on your social media. Like and subscribe here so that it, that that causes the algorithms to actually spread it to more people. It's more important than you may think. But take this video here. Take the link and, and tag it on social media. Go to Twitter. Uh, go to Telegram. Spread this out there so more people know the truth. Because ultimately, the thing that animates me more than anything else is that the bill payers for all of this mendacity and for all this nonsense are the Ukrainian people. And the men that they're going to need to fund their future uh, country once they get this war over with and rebuild everything – they can't afford to throw tens of thousands of them into the trash like they're doing right now. And as long as that can, this war continues on, that's exactly what's going to happen. They can't change the outcome. Let's share this message with as many people as possible so that more people know the truth. And maybe we can build up enough momentum for the truth that it can actually impact the decision makers. That power is potentially within your hands. So I ask you to wield it as best you can. Thank you very much for coming on today. Uh, we always appreciate you and value you. We are in this together. We will remain unintimidated and uncompromised to bring you the truth. And we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.